What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Big dogs. Gotta eat. It's bright and early, so if I look like I'm not a human, I would explain it. I've got the extra large coffee. By the end of this video, the energy will be there, I promise, because we're doing a 2022 first round fantasy football draft today. I know, I know, I know. I'll explain myself. It's ridiculous. It's no, it's December. Why the fuck am I doing it? All right. Multiple reasons. One, because I don't, because it's my channel. I can do whatever the fuck I want and, and it's fun to do it. All right. I, I don't know. I just got inspired yesterday because Underdog opened up their 2022 best ball drafts. So I wanted to rip a couple of them off and we did one yesterday and we'll go over the, the results of that first round. And then I'll go through my personal first round mock draft of how I see things playing out or how I would make the picks. And to be honest with you, I don't know. I did it and it was really tough. And I know I'm going to, you guys are going to fucking yell at me and then I'm going to second guess myself and then we're going to move things around and shit. But I don't know. It's fun to mess around with this kind of stuff right now. Yeah. So we're going to run through the first round of a mock for next year. And then I'm going to open up multiple drafts on underdog throughout the next week or so and they're open for anyone to join right now but i'm assuming most people aren't going to fill up those lobbies so you'll probably have to get into my custom drafts if you want to get in on them so if you want to draft with us on underdog for 2022 you're gonna to have to obviously sign up on underdog download the app it'll be the first link in the description um, and when you make your first deposit on there whether it's 10 or 20 or 50 when you use a promo code bdge you're gonna get a 100 percent deposit match now i know a lot of y'all are saying like why the fuck are you doing a draft this early for 2022 i don't tomorrow i might rip off a 2024 first round mock draft you think i care what the streets are saying no i'm for the street i am the streets all right we're out here fucking paving the fantasy football streets i don't play best ball for money i play it for fun i play it for adp purposes to follow the trends to make content for you guys so we're all staying on top of the player movements man i don't play dfs which means i don't play these games for money all right plays games for fucking pride i also lose a lot so i don't i'm not a very proud person that being said underdog has got the 2022s open we're about to open this thing up before we do so y'all know the rules let's tuck our shirts in stop yelling and let's see <laughs> Also, if you do sign up on Underdog, the links to the drafts that I'm going to be opening up for the next week or so, I'll, I'll post them on Twitter. So make sure you're following me. I will post them uh, in our Discord. So if you're not a member already, bdge.store forward slash community, all that good stuff. So you'll know where to find them eventually. Just follow me on social and I'll be throwing out fucking links like I'm a fisherman, baby. All right, let's start it off. So we did the Underdog draft and I'm not going to analyze all the picks, but I just want to show you how the very first 2022 draft played out. And this is as of week th through week 13 of the 2021 season. We have C-Mac at the 101, Jonathan Taylor at the 102. Like I said, I'm not going to analyze this, but that is just fucking egregious. JT is the clear 101 for next year. JT, 102. We had Derrick Henry at three, Najee Harris, four, Austin Eckler, five, Joe Mixon, six, Cooper Cup, seven. My pick, Nick Chubb at eight, Alvin Kamara at nine. Devontae Adams at 10, DeAndre Swift at 11, and Travis Kelsey at 12. So that was the very first look at what a first round draft might be next year. Now, again, there's three, four, five weeks left in this regular season. If we did not have weeks 14 through 17 last year, 14 through 18 last year, or whatever, we wouldn't be looking at JT as such a highly regarded pick this year. We, David Montgomery probably would have fallen. You know, there was a lot that can happen in the last month of the season. So again, this is after 13 weeks of the season all right so we've made this little chart and tony will kind of creep it up the screen as we go through our picks because we don't want to ruin it this is going to be fun we're going to have good surprises we're all having fun out here right guys with the 101 as it should come to no surprise to any of you guys as i literally have already said it mr jonathan taylor through 13 weeks he is averaging 22 opportunities per game 22.3 fantasy points per game and is the overall rb one, or at least tied with Derrick Henry in terms of points per game. His 16 game pace is 2,073 yards. We're going to stick to two, uh, 16 game paces for all the stats I talk about because it's just still easy and our, our brains are not like we're not evolved in us as a species to understand 17 game paces yet. 2,073 yards so he's topping the 2000 yard mark he is on pace for 22 touchdowns and there's really nothing else to be said here if you go look at his player profiler page it is littered with just the number ones across the fucking board jonathan taylor is the generational prospect that we wished fucking Clyde edwards hilaire's ass was 
that we wish Saquon Barkley's was at this point. But if you look at the efficiency metrics, number seven in true yards per carry, number six in yards per touch, number one in breakaway runs, top 10 in breakaway run rate, number one overall in evaded tackles, number one overall in juke rate. Just like, like I said, number one just littered across the fucking board. Jonathan Taylor is having a season for the motherfucking ages. That being said, when we move to number two, my 102 right now is Mr. Derrick Henry. He is obviously on the sidelines for the remainder of the season, but first things to note, you know, people out there might be saying like, oh, it's a foot injury. Oh, he's older. This is like his time. He goes downhill. Listen, the only time Derrick Henry goes downhill is when he fucking ends defenders lives. When there's a hole, when there's a gap and he's putting his head into their fucking sternum and breaking chest bones. No one has broken more chest. You know what? Listen, Zendaya close second, but no one has broken more hearts physically than Derrick Henry. All right. He's going to be back in like January. He might actually play this year. They make the playoffs. He's probably going to play. So I'm not worried about 2022 at all. And you shouldn't be either. Through eight weeks of the season, he is tied with Jonathan Taylor in terms of fantasy points per game, 22.3. They're averaging the same number of fantasy points per game up to this point in the season. So he's tied for the RB1 rank. This is insane. Derrick Henry was averaging 29.9. So literally 30 opportunities per Per game every year we say it there's no way you know he goes up there's no way he does better but guess what he got involved in the fucking passing game this year he's been out for like four or five weeks at this point and he's still like top two or three in every rushing category 16 game yardage pace 2182 yards 20 fucking touchdowns i'm not worried about next year when it comes to injuries for derrick henry this is going to be uh one of the funner topics this this summer when we talk about being worried about injuries for next year. I have Christian McCaffrey at the 103, all right? Um, he's only played in seven games up to this point in this season, and he's out for the remainder of the year. That would give him a total of 10 games over the last two years that he's played in out of a possible 32. The way I look at Christian McCaffrey, and maybe I'm taking the wrong approach to this, you know, maybe there's a little bit more to it. Up to this point, he's averaged 20 opportunities per game, only 15.6 fantasy points per game, but, you know, he's been injured multiple times, so he's gotten taken out of games early. He is the RB8, which is a downgrade in terms of, like, utility and in terms of production, typically for Mr. Christian McCaffrey, because even when he started the year before he got hurt, he was averaging, like, 25, 26 fantasy points per game. That's easy league-winning type numbers. Not even, like, Jonathan Taylor is touching those type numbers that, that Christian McCaffrey was putting up in his prime. Christian McCaffrey, when I look at him, it's like, he has all these lingering muscle injuries, right? The calves and the hamstrings and things like that. He's not coming off a torn Achilles. He's not coming off a torn ACL on like seven months rest or whatever. Those are the things that I look for when I'm trying to predict injuries. And maybe it's naive. Maybe I'm not sure because I'm only technically a doctor out here in the streets. But C-Mac, listen, he's going to get a lot of shit this offseason. He's 25 years old, guys. Like he's 25 fucking years old. There's a lot of dudes out here. I'm pretty sure Jonathan Taylor is like 25 years old. I'm pretty sure Damien Harris is like 35 fucking years old. He's not 28. All right. Like, I can understand if Christian McCaffrey is like 28, 29, and he put up an elite year last year, and then he's coming off all these injuries, and now we're worried about him. Yeah, I would be super, super worried about him. The way I look at it is like you look at any other like running back you can pick in this area, like the Ecklers, the Kamaras, the Mixons, the Cooks, all of them have their own injury concerns over the year. All of them have pulled just as many fucking hamstrings, have pulled just as many calf muscles, have done all this just as many times as C-Mac has, and none of them have anywhere close to the upside C-Mac has. So I'm willing to use the top three pick on Mr. Christian McCaffrey. Also, Christian McCaffrey has a 16 game pace of 1,794 total yards, 4.6 touchdowns. 4.6 touchdowns. All right. And if there's anything that I think we can pretty much solidly say is that's not a predictable number, right? If had Christian McCaffrey scored, you know, seven or eight touchdowns up to this point, I think we'd still be looking at him a little bit differently. My first wide receiver off the board, y'all know I am not a wide receiver person. I don't like to use first round picks on him, but I got him at the 107 in the underdog draft. Cooper Cup is my 104. Through 12 games, he's averaging 11.3 targets per game, 21 fantasy points per game in half PPR, in half PPR. We talk a lot about in the summer what league winning type fantasy production looks like. And for me, in my opinion, anything over 20 points per game and half PPR is what I would consider a league winning type player. This year, we have a few of them, right? We have Jonathan Taylor. We had Derrick Henry, Cooper Cup. We almost never see that with wide receivers. We've seen it probably two or three times over the last 10 years, right? Usually the wide receiver one in fantasy points per game is averaging like 16 and a half, 17 and a half. This year is a big year for wide receivers. Cooper Cup averaging 21 points per game, which is still actually half a point per game less than what Devonta Adams averaged last year. He was at 21.5, but still he's the wide receiver one by far this year. Cooper Cup's on pace for 1,821 yards, 15 touchdowns, all right? 181 targets, 133 catches. This dude ain't the next Calvin Johnson. 
105. All right, let's get spicy. Let's get spicy. Man, this shit's going to be as spicy as ketchup by the time the summer comes around, man. At the 105. Hear me out. Hear me out. At the 105, Javante Williams. Javante Williams of the Denver Broncos. I know this is going to seem reactionary. I know this is going to seem out of control based on last week's game. I don't think I needed to see anything more than like we've seen his small bits of efficiency throughout the year sprinkled in big plays, highlight plays, catching passes, goal line carries. We just haven't seen it all put together in one single game. And with Melvin Gordon out last week, I didn't need, I don't need to see anything fucking more to know that he's going to be the workhorse next year and at a high 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 level through 12 weeks averaging only 15.2 opportunities per game 11 fantasy points per game he's the rb25 he will be like a top 15 back by the time the year ends and he's only played like 40 percent of the snaps through 12 weeks so that's going to be a major major accomplishment 16 game pace right now 1250 yards only five touchdowns melvin gordon has seven touchdowns on the year so think most of that going over to javante williams melvin gordon is a free agent after this year i don't see them resigning him i mean he he, he did his job for the broncos the last two years right he's not really gonna be a guy that they want to spend money on again in the market again i i think he served his purpose denver is going to be looking hard in the qb market this uh this free agency and i don't think they want to spend money on on a running back again because they have a guy like javante williams all right so i feel extremely confident having him as my rb1 a high-end rb1 next year goal line carries catching passes big enough to handle that kind of workload the ceiling for Javante Williams next year undoubtedly is the RB1 overall I mean obviously it's going to be tough to, to top Taylor but like I don't think it's out of the range of outcomes for Javante Williams so right now I'm putting him up at the 105 he didn't go in the first round of underdog because he was like down the rankings a little bit and you know that just happens in the beginning until the ADP starts shifting up and then you realize there's like an amazing fucking player all the way down at rank 422 and then you know you get like 42 shares of him that's what's also fun about doing underdog drafts this early so make sure you sign up for underdog and when you deposit for the first time promo code bdg at the 106 this will be a fun spot in the draft as well to argue about a bit at the 106 i think you can argue any of like the next three guys but i personally have austin eckler at the 106 through 12 games he's averaging 18.3 opportunities per game 19.2 fantasy points per game and is the rb3 on the season he is on pace to hit 1575 yards and way more importantly 20 touchdowns so the sentiment that i echoed all offseason and i made a video that was like three players who have the ceiling of the rb1 overall this season and austin eckler is one of the three players rest in peace to cam fucking acres he would have had an amazing fucking year god damn still hurts to this day my sentiment was like they have a new coach coming in so there's a chance that austin eckler like when anthony lynn was there no matter how untalented the back was if he stepped on the scale and weighed more than austin eckler he was getting the goal line touches not happening this year with the new coach we were like you know there's a chance that austin eckler now gets the goal line carries that happened the one problem Problem, the one problem I have with Austin Eckler, and if there's anyone that I'd imagine moving much further down the ADP, it would be him. Like the guys behind him, who I'll talk about in a second, you know, the Najis and the Alvin Kamars and stuff, they're rock solid. They're going to stay in the first round of ADPs all offseason. Eckler probably will too. The only thing I'm worried about with Eckler is that I think they clearly want to have a committee, right? They've tried really hard over the last like three to four years drafting guys in the draft, drafting running backs in the draft. They're all terrible, but they're, you know, they just need to get better at drafting. But once they do hit on a guy, I think they're really, really sold on having some sort of committee okay and a lot of you guys are like well even in committee we see it. yeah he's at the fucking six pick get get over yourself right but i do think if they find a solid back that they draft if they use third or fourth round capital on a, on a back again and try this again and do hit there will be more of a committee and he could lose some of the goal line work there that he's seen so much of this year so that's my only concern with Eckler right now is that they they've actively shown us that they want to continue adding some kind of running back they've tried it over and over again and it just doesn't work like they're all the backup we don't even know who the backup is right now it's a rotation of shitty shitty running backs running out on the field so that's my only concern, but I mean, like, you know, getting someone in, the, in this offense, like you want pieces of the Chargers offense. Their offensive line is much improved this year. You want guys tethered to Justin Herbert. So like Eckler, you know, at the 106, that's where I got him. At the 107, we have Mr. Najee Harris averaging 24.1 opportunities per game right now. 15.6 fantasy points per game. Is that correct? I feel like he's got to be higher than that. He is the RB8 on the year right now. If you pace his numbers out, he is looking at 1,555 total yards, 9.3 touchdowns what i think is going to happen with Najee is i don't think i'm going to project him for much more ceiling than whatever he produced this year he's a superhero volume type of guy with like extra medium efficiency and i don't think it's his fault man i think i saw a stat on twitter yesterday that he's had two runs of over 20 yards this year now on the insane number of carries he's gotten that's you know what we'd call not good in the business there's still two problems right quarterback they're not gonna have big ben next year which honestly might 
be the opposite of a problem. And their O-line is still shit. Those are not going to change overnight unless Aaron Rodgers comes to town, which I think is actually a distinct possibility. But regardless, you know, by all accounts, Najee lived up to his first round NFL draft capital as a first round, you know, fantasy football pick. 1,500 plus yards from scrimmage. He's going to catch over 75 passes. He's on pace to catch over 75 passes this year on a 16 game pace. Like, so, you know, you couldn't have asked for more drafting a guy like Najee Harris. All offseason, we were like, there's no way he doesn't get an insane amount of volume. Throughout the preseason, he was playing on 95% of the snaps. So it was super easy to kind of see this coming. And then we're like, he's a good pass catcher. He'll catch a lot of balls. It's happening. Problem is, again, like O-line, QB, very much an issue. So I'm projecting Najee to have another year next year like he did this year, which is great, you know. And uh, I think you can kind of already pencil in what he's going to do next year. So I'm not, I'm, I don't think it's anything more than a lot of the same for this year. Move down from 107 to 108. And we have Mr. Alvin Kamara. Okay. Alvin Kamara currently averaging 23.8 opportunities per game, 17.8 fantasy points per game. And it's the RB four points per game right now. He's obviously missed some time. He's only played in eight games, but dude, if you had told me in the beginning of the year that Alvin Kamara was going to average 23.8 opportunities per game, he probably would have been the 101. That's unfortunate because he's not playing like the 101 right now. And here, here's the thing, like he's down here at the 108 because I think like him, like Dalvin Cook, the injury concerns are real. There's And with C-Mac as well, again, but I think C-Mac's got a ceiling that will obviously win you your fantasy league if he hits. They're starting to, to pile up his injury record, his track record and injuries. However, however, I want to say let's not overblow Alvin Kamara's injury history here, all right? This is going to be his first year not playing over 14 games or not playing 14 or more games. Even me personally, like when I was looking at this, I thought you basically pencil in Alvin Kamara missing three to four games per year. But when I look back on it, since he entered the league, he's played in 16 games, 15 games, 14 games, and 15 games, all right? So he's always there. Like he's typical missing one or two games for running back. It's, you know, what most running backs end up doing. So I don't think this needs to be blown up any more than what it is, right? We're obviously going to come off this year where he's missing, you know, six, seven games and say like, oh, fuck, like he's injury prone, et cetera. He's still the centerpiece of this offense that runs through him. The The QB situation is shot, but like he'll be fine. Just like C-Mac, who's 25 years old, Kamara's 26 years old, got the passing work. And again, like this offense, if if he can stay healthy and they're going to give him 23 to 24 touches per game, he's going to be a fucking problem. All right. You know who else is going to be a fucking problem for the next 10 years? Say with me. Justin Jefferson is 22 years old, 22 years old. Like you see these wide receivers break out and play at the level of Justin Jefferson. Like Cooper Cup's like 27, 28. Justin Jefferson's like almost trailing him in pace yards. And Jefferson is 22 years old. It's un unbelievable. So right now, Justin Jefferson is averaging 9.3 targets per game, 16.8 half PPR fantasy points per game. And he's the wide receiver three at the moment. Uh, on pace for 1,631 yards, 9.3 touchdowns. In PPR leagues, he's averaging over 20 fantasy points per game. And there aren't there aren't a lot of places that you can say, I, I'm going to draft Jefferson this early, and I'd argue back with you, man. I don't know how to find the stats right now. I'm going to be honest. I, I tried hard. I'm usually really good at being able to find whatever stats I want. But I can't imagine through the first 26 games or the first 28 games of a player's career, he has 2,600 yards through 28 career games. That's got to be top three of all time at worst, right? Maybe like OBJ off the top of my head. Anquan Bolden had that monster rookie year, but I don't think he kept that pace into his second. Uh, first 28 games, 2,600 yards. That's unbelievable. And again, he's 22 fucking years old. Bro, Jefferson is going to have some... I, I He's just going to be putting up like 1,700 yards, I feel like, for the next 10 years in a row. It's insane. So Jefferson at the 109, I mean, he's he's just going to be a staple of this offense forever. Speaking of this offense in Minnesota, I have Dalvin Cook at the 110. He's on a 16-game pace of 1,733 yards, only seven touchdowns. Now, that number would be way, way higher, but he's gotten stuffed on the one-yard line like 46 fucking times. But he's averaging 23.3 opportunities per game. He's only played in nine games. The injury history is real. 14.6 fantasy points per game. He's the RB12, but again, a lot of that's just to do with touchdown luck. So here's the problem with Dalvin Cook, man. It, the same point that I made for C-Mac again with him making with a lot of these players is that we're not going to be able to predict these injuries, right? And the upside for Dalvin Cook is is similar to like Christian McCaffrey and shit. You're looking at guys like DeAndre Swift, Joe Mixon, Nick Chubb, Saquon, and Antonio Gibson. Like, again, all have injury concerns down in this part of the draft. Now, Cook has that fat contract extension from Minnesota. So he's not going anywhere. He's going to be the workhorse for at least the next like year, two years, whatever. And they have no problem feeding him 23, 25 touches a game. The thing that does scare me, that's one of the actual predictive injuries in football 
the shoulder shit he's been dealing with. This was a problem in college. This was a problem a couple of years ago. The more it happens, the more likely it is to recur. So this is not a surprise to people that were in the medical field that the shoulder thing just happened to him. He's going to miss a couple of games. The problem is it's very, very likely that this happens again next year. You know, on top of all the normal injury risks that every running back comes with, the sprained ankles, the ACL tears, et cetera, the shoulder injury is almost like, I'm not going to say it's a guarantee to happen, but it's extremely likely that it happens again over the next year or two years or something like that. So Dalvin Cook's one of the few players that's going to go into the actual 2022 season. Like Christian McCaffrey is obviously going to be completely healed by the time that season kicks off next year. Dalvin Cook, though, is going in with a higher re-injury risk than most. And I'll have him at 110 because his upside is so high. I probably personally won't be drafting him in the first round next year. I'm okay being the guy that misses out and hoping that he doesn't hit his ceiling because he'll be a league winner as per usual. We move down one more spot and kind of a guy similar to Mr. Dalvin Cook is DeAndre Swift. Now, DeAndre Swift is currently averaging 19.1 opportunities per game, also 14.6 fantasy points per game. So he's tied with Mr. Dalvin Cook. DeAndre Swift's 16 game yardage pace is 1,431. It's actually a little bit more disappointing than I thought it was going to be. His 16 game touchdown pace is 8.7. Jamal Williams is signed through next year. On his contract, they can save money if they cut him. I don't think they're going to cut him. He's just like a good football player, someone good to have on the team. They could cut him if they think Jamar Jefferson can play that role successfully, which I don't think is out of the range of possibilities. But regardless, I think like we've also seen that Swift is probably going to be in some sort of committee. To me, DeAndre Swift seems like a guy who we're going to see a lot of the same of next year. Similar to the argument I'll be making with like Najee Harris most of the offseason, this year was probably the year to draft those guys because you squeezed. I mean, th listen, they'll be fine for your team next year, obviously. But if you were talking about the value gap of where you were drafting them to where they're going to produce this, you know, 2021 was the year that you were going to get all that out of it. But for Swift, I think we're going to see a lot of the same next year as we did for this year. They're a really bad offense. We don't know who the fuck the quarterback is going to be. There's going to be a ton of dump offs. I think there's going to be a split backfield again. Swift is seeing just 12.7 carries per game this year, all right? That's 17th in the league. Is it unacceptable? Yes. But to be honest, he hasn't really been that great on the ground. I think anyone who watches the Lions games knows that. Like DeAndre Swift has, honestly, he's not been that much better than like Jamal Williams carrying the ball. Is he more explosive? Does he has better plays? Sure. He has some great plays, but he hasn't been great on the ground is basically the point I'm getting at. He's made his money through the air, especially in garbage time. And again, like I said, I expect that to be the case next year as well. I, I think it's kind of like Austin Eckler going into this year. They're very similar players. And this is where just about Eckler was being drafted going into this year, like the 111, 112 in a lot of drafts. The only difference when I look at it is the, I think Swift is probably a better runner, or at least a better runner in terms of like fantasy and like his build a little bit bigger. The only difference is the, the offense though, like Austin Eckler's on the fucking Chargers and DeAndre Swift's on the Lions, where just like Pittsburgh, again, it's going to take a little bit of time for these teams to rebuild their entire offense. Is it going to run through these players? Sure. I, I still see this being a committee backfield with DeAndre Swift, who also has had you know, his fair share of, of, uh, of injuries at this point into his, is into his career. And I think it's like a real concern that they might look at that and say like, hey, we don't want to give him 20 touches a game. We don't want to give him 25 touches a game because he's sort of an injury risk. And we've already seen this coaching staff use a committee. So that's my concern with Swift. I think a PPR league, obviously you move him up, but I think the 111 is like the right spot. He's going to give you some great games. He's going to give you a really high floor in PPR leagues, but I don't know if we have the ceiling because he's not going to get the opportunities, the touches and in the bad offense. Lastly, at the 112, a lot of players you can put here man a lot of players you can put here this was tough let me know drop a comment down below who you would have at the 112 here I think the argument could be made for, I mean, Devontae Adams seems like he's a really good spot here. Uh, Nick Chubb, I think, should obviously be super dupe. I feel like Nick Chubb's just going to be the 112 for the next like five years. He has been for the last like two two years. He will be for the next five years. But I have, kind of pains me to say, but it's Joe Mixon at the 112. 16 game yardage pace of 1,560 yards, 16 game touchdown pace this year, 18.7. All right. He's on pace to score 19 touchdowns this year and it's been beautiful if you owned him man joe mixon opportunities per game 21.5 17.7 fantasy points per game currently the rb5 now i do have my concerns with mixon man i do have them of course you know i wasn't gonna just fucking throw out all positive on mixon you know you know i had to fucking bring the negative energy when it comes to mixon monster year for him 
in an offense that you do want pieces of in the future, okay? That's like, this is an offense clearly on the rise. It's an offense that Burrow is going to be so good for so long. These passing game weapons are great. They're going to keep drives moving. The offensive line is slowly improving. Again, just a team that you want pieces on. So I'm still not sure why I'm so hesitant to draft him this high. My my biggest concern is that, to me, it's so clear that they want someone to play that Gio Bernard role. And we all remember what what Joe Mixon was in that Gio Bernard role. He was capped at like a 1,200 yard per season player. He was capped at like 35 catches. The touchdown upside, this was like what we were looking for. This was best case scenario, what we're seeing this year, and that Mixon's on pace for 19 fucking touchdowns. And in a good offense, that can happen, right? Like next year, he might drop back down to 35 catches for the year. He might drop down to like 19 touches per game, but he can still rip off 12, 13, 14 touchdowns, which is what obviously makes him a good first round pick. I think they want to give Mixon 20 plus carries per game for the rest of his contract, right? Like play bully ball. But in games that like Chris Evans and Samaji P. Ryan have played this year, it's hurt Mixon's pass catching for real. He's barely averaging over two catches per game, man. And it's hard to sell a player in the first round that's averaging just two catches per game, man. He's tied for 35th in the NFL and targets among running backs. And for someone who's sixth among running backs in the NFL and snaps this year, that's not a good ratio, okay? So I think we might see a kind of plateau for Mixon in terms of his pass catching involvement. This was the year that like, you know, Chris Evans and Samaji P. Ryan, Samaji fucking P. Ryan, y'all, is the one that's like taking pass catching work from him. And that is my problem. He's been very effective volume wise, but efficiency wise, he he hasn't been, man. And that's that's like one of the concerns I have for, for a guy like Mixon. Yards per reception, 29th. Yards per out run, 40th. Yards per touch, 38th. Breakaway run rate, 22nd. Juke rate, 28th. Yards created per touch, 43rd. He's been great for NFL. He's been great for your fantasy team because he's scoring a lot of touchdowns and getting a lot of volume. And again, I do expect that to be the case. But this kind of seems like best case scenario, the season that we had for Mixon this year. And the likelihood of him returning this these type of numbers again as a top five fantasy back, to me, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like it's there for me. So end of the first round makes a lot of sense. I think in the underdog draft, he went at like 106. That's going to be a little bit too spicy for me, okay? I'd rather settle on guys like, Najee Harris or guys like Austin Eckler, who I think bring more upside. Alvin Kamara, who we've seen do it, but obviously has his injury concerns, as is Joe Mixon. You know, yearly he deals with injuries and shit. So that wraps up the uh, first 12 picks, I think. Let me recap it for y'all. We had 101, Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, Christian McCaffrey, Cooper Cup, Javonta Williams, Austin Eckler, Najee Harris, Alvin Kamara, Justin Jefferson, Dalvin Cook, DeAndre Swift, and Joe Mixon at the 112, wrapping it the freak up. So again, we're going to be ripping off a bunch of drafts on underdog because they open the 2022 best ball drafts. They also, I believe, just open playoff best ball drafts. So we'll probably be ripping off a few of those tomorrow. I'm going to do a live stream where I'm doing a 2022 draft. So if you want in on that, make sure you obviously download the app. Use the promo code BDGE when you do your first deposit. All these drafts are $3 minimum uh, because you're playing for actual money. So when you use the promo code BDGE, they're going to double your deposit match. That didn't make sense. You're going to double your deposit amount. All right. That's all I got. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure that you hit the thumbs up button if you did. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. And I'll see you all tomorrow on the live stream. Goodbye.